Hi, I'm Belinda Carley, the Director of the Institute of Personal Care Science. And I get asked a lot of little questions about chelating agents and I had a little look on the internet and there is some good information, but as normal, there's a lot of misinformation about chelating agents. So I thought I'd do a video on chelating agents for you to help guide you in when you do need them, when you don't need them, and what they actually do or do not do in a formula. Well, the very first thing and fundamental aspect of a chelating agent is that it sequesters metal ions in a formula. Basically, it binds to metal ions that may be present in your formula. Now, this is very desirable when you don't have a great water source. Having said that, you should always be using demineralized water because you don't want excess ions in your water. But you still need a chelating agent if there are free metal ions in the water. This can also happen in very small amounts, but that's all that needs to be present from some manufacturing equipment. It's also a big problem when you're using some pigments like iron oxides, for example. There are some free ions in there. There's some sunscreen actives that require chelating agents to help them achieve a good shelf life. And there's some surfactants like naturally saponified soaps and sulfates that also need chelating agents to help sequester any ions in the water, otherwise you end up with that hard scum around baths or showers. Free metal ions can cause oxidation and discoloration in products. They can speed up oxidative changes which can lead to discoloration, unfavorable aromas forming, pH shifts and even separation of emulsions over time. So using a chelating agent sequesters these free metal ions and reduces the rate of any oxidative type reactions. You can still use your antioxidant, and in fact, you need to use antioxidant where you have essential oils or plant oils present because they will oxidize over time. But your chelating agent can help boost their efficacy. So you protect the formula from oxidative changes for longer when you use both. Chelating agents can also help boost preservative efficacy. They're not preservatives on their own but they can help your preservatives work better. So especially in a more challenging or nutrient rich formula, chelating agents can help improve the efficacy of your preservative system. You still need a good preservative system, but your chelating agent is helping make sure it's even stronger than when it's not present. Some acid-based preservatives may also have free ions present. So chelating agents can help stop any discoloration that may form from the presence of these acid-based preservatives in your system. If the preservative you're using has acid in the inky name, then a chelating agent will not only help boost its efficacy, but protect against any discoloration that may occur from the use of that preservative over time. So if chelating agents are so great, why don't we just add them to every formula? Well, there's a couple of cases where they're especially not suited. Chelating agents carry charge. So if you use them in formulas where there is a charge sensitive material, you could impact the efficacy or performance of that material. For example, a lot of your polymers. Now, many of your polymers can handle the small amount of chelating agent that is present, but it can reduce how well they perform. In some cases, you might find some materials simply don't give the viscosity or stability enhancing benefits you'd expect if a chelating agent is present. So that's one scenario where you may not want to use a chelating agent. Don't use chelating agents in conditioners. Chelating agents carry a negative charge. Again, we're only using small amounts of these materials, but the negative charge with the positively charged conditioning agent can mean you get some small insoluble complexes forming over time. So don't use chelating agents where you have a positively charged cationic emulsifier or surfactant present. You don't want to use a chelating agent where you specifically want the presence of these ions. For example, some actives 
work by delivering magnesium ions. You don't want a chelating agent present if the purpose of your active is to deliver these ions to the skin. Some clays work by having their high mineral content present. Again, another scenario where you wouldn't want chelating agents present because it will chelate to these ions in the clay and make them less available for activity on the skin where you really want them to perform. So some actives may not be suitable with chelating agents where you want the ions present to provide the benefits to the skin. Another case where you don't want chelating agents is in water in oil emulsions, especially where you're using a salt or magnesium sulfate heptahydrate to help stabilize your water in oil emulsion. So what sort of chelating agents are there? The most common one you would probably be aware of is ethylene diamine tetracetic acid or EDTA. Now the ones we commonly use in personal care is disodium EDTA or tetrasodium EDTA. Tetrasodium EDTA is slightly more water soluble than disodium EDTA and is better suited to clear formulations, but either works just fine. Now we only use very small amounts of these materials and only what we need for the formula, typically between 0.05 to 0.2% maximum. There's a lot of misinformation about the dangers of chelating agents on the internet, and this is more to do with when they're ingested, not topical applications. They're perfectly safe in topically applied formulas, but they're not biodegradable. They're also synthetically produced. So you wouldn't want to use them in naturally derived formulas. And you also need to be aware that they're not biodegradable when they wash out into our waterways. Another really common alternative that is naturally derived and even allowed in organic formulas is sodium phytate or phytic acid. Now this is available from several different suppliers under different trade names. So I can't give you an exact percentage to use because they all come as different grades of material. So refer to your supplier's information for the specific grade you want to use to get the best input specific to each material. It's still only a very small input. It can raise the pH of your formula slightly, so just be prepared for that when you're doing your final pH adjustment. But it normally doesn't have too big an impact on your formula and goes into your formulations quite easily. It's also naturally derived and biodegradable, so it's a better environmental choice to use one of these sodium phytate or phytic acid grades. Again, speak with your supplier about the best input rates specific to the grade of material that you want to use because different grades have different input requirements. Finally, there is another chelating agent that we use commonly in formulas, but it's not usually enough at the inputs we use, and that is citric acid. Little bits of citric acid for pH adjustment can sometimes counter any color changes we may see from say acid-based preservatives. But just be aware we're often not using enough citric acid in pH adjustment to provide a strong chelating benefit to help protect against oxidative changes, to boost preservative efficacy, or work in some of those more challenging formulas. But it can help and we use it in a lot of formulas to adjust pH anyway. Sodium phytate or phytic acid is by far the best biodegradable choices. Just remember to check supplier information carefully to get the best input that suits your formula. If you'd like a summary of all of this information, please contact us. We're happy to provide it to you so that you can learn when to use chelating agents, when not to, and the truth about their applications. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a thumbs up. Please leave any questions or comments below and make sure you subscribe to receive notifications about all our videos. Happy formulating.